Hi, I'm Lynn Hardy, and we are here today talking about the new and old wineskin, as long as well as formula and witchcraft prayers. All of these topics belong together, and one truly cannot be discussed without the other. So today we're covering all of those topics at the online Christian church. Now we know that every great revelation of power and authority that came from God, it seems to undergo or has undergone the same process. First, there's the discovery. That is the statement to, uh, of an initial realization of something that was hidden or forgotten within the Bible. Seeds of this new or renewed information are planted, and it takes time to grow. That is the discovery phase of a new revelation. After this, it goes through acceptance. New discoveries are not widely accepted at first, but after some time, they become more mainstream, resulting often in revival. Now, next comes the formula stage. As revelations become widely known and accepted, man begins creating formulas for how to operate in it. A formula, a formula prayers are something that is one plus one equals two. We say this and we expect always to get the same result. When we say or do something, it produces a result. Well, formula always results in degradation. Eventually, every power-based revelation that has come forth has gone through a loss in the anointing of God, the power of God. And this is because man has taken control through formula. Now, this can clearly be seen in the 20th century revivals that brought great wisdom from God. Some of the most well-known types of revivals are this. First, there was a healing revival. God poured out his glory at times, which has been seen in the healing revivals. Healing came upon mankind, but 95% of those who were healed were in worse shape within a year after receiving that healing. This is because the healing revival was just prayers for healing, and it did not cause them to turn to God, to learn his ways, and to remove sin from their life. We relied on formula of entreating God for prayer, for entering in his presence to receive healing. And that rev revival came to an end because people failed to reach out to God, to learn his ways once they received that healing. Now, there was an authority revelation that came. It was a revelation that was well known as the Jesus movement. It was authority in the name and the blood. Now, when we realized that there was power in the name, once again, I'm sure they realized that in the time of Acts, but now we realized it once again. Names and classes of demons were catalogs and prayers were written and formed and, and, and how to remove demons through the name of Jesus. You see, we took the names in our, or the reins in our own hands and depended on what we knew instead of leaning on the Holy Spirit. And this was largely due to the prayers that were being said as a matter of formula, not inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now, this movement became the lacking stock of jokes around the world. Comedians would claim, the devil made me do it. And the power of God diminished, though, throughout the majority of the body of Christ. Now, there was also a worship revelation that came forth. The body of Christ realized that when we worship God, his presence comes into that moment and it fills a need, not only in our hearts, but often it brought signs, wonders, and miracles. 
well, once we realize mankind realized that that worship brought these things with it began being turned into a formula. Most services would begin with two fast songs followed by a slow one where God was not in the hearts of those leading the worship. You see, God is looking at our hearts, not at merely the words we're singing. And when our hearts were not turned towards him, then the meetings would fall flat. Church would seem tedious. It would lack energy. This is because it was devoid of God's presence, his power. They brought in smoke machines, other special effects. They made the, the songs fancier, more in alignment with the world's music, trying to energize rather than rest in and lean upon God in his presence. Unless the Holy Spirit is involved in worship, it is mere entertainment, and the meeting will be devoid of God's true presence. Then we had the word of faith, revelation. This movement is all often called the name it and claim it theology and includes the prosperity doctrine. There was a revelation that there is great power in our words and in the word of God. And although this is a wonderful and necessary revelation, when we focus on getting our words right so that we can receive, we begin seeking victory, freedom, and healing from God rather than seeking God. We are seeking the right words and the right prayers instead of connecting with God. We turn our words and prayers into formula. We are convinced that if we just say it enough times and have enough faith, that something will be accomplished. Instead of having faith in God and what he has done, instead of seeking him and his ways. Now then, the last movement, movement well, there's two more movements that I'll talk about. There's the grace movement. Now, God is full of grace and mercy. Knowing this statement is so important in order to receive all that God has for us. The enemy has come into the church, though, and made this teaching into a formula with a message that states that it doesn't matter if we sin because the blood of Jesus provides grace for all our sins. And this nothing could be further from the truth. You see, when we turn confession into a mere declaration of our sin instead of repentance and turning from it and seeing it the way God does, then we have created a formula out of grace and grace is no longer effective. God will not be mocked. He sees our hearts and many are under an attack because of the grace formula. Last but not least, the courts of heaven there was a revelation that came forth in 2001, and by 2011, there was a best-selling book about the courts of heaven. There have been successes by entering into the courts. Books have been written many more since that time. However, it has been turned into a formula. Just do this and say that, and you will receive this breakthrough. Christians have failed to realize that the courts of heaven are the highest place of authority in he under heaven and earth. And that when you enter into the courts without being able to see or hear, nothing will be gained. It, you cannot enter in with a written set of procedures. Would you enter into an earthly court with a written set of procedures? declaring and decreeing what you want without being able to see anything around you, without being able to hear from the judge. But yet it is done in the courts of heaven. To receive victory and continued victory, we must not depend upon prayers that man has written. For this is turning revelations into an old wineskin. We must be like David, who was the most victorious warrior in all of Israel. Remember, before he went to battle, he would pray and ask God, which way should I go this time? 
This is the attitude that he sung about in one of his psalms. This is Psalm 39, verses 8 through 10 in the Amplified Classic Version. I, the Lord, will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like the horse or the mule, which lacks understanding, which must have their mouths held firm and a bit and bright, or else they will not come with you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in, relies on, confidently leans upon the Lord, shall be encompassed about with mercy and loving kindness. You see, we must not be stuck in a pattern of expectation and presumptuousness. Depending upon the patterns of the past is having our mouths held firmly with a bridle and a bit. We must be willing to trust in and rely upon the Lord for every prayer. That is the new wineskin that will keep revelations flowing from God. What exactly is the new wineskin? If you've not been immersed in Christian culture, this term may be unfamiliar to you. To understand why this is a danger, we need to know, one, what does the Bible say about the old wineskin? And B, what does it mean to be in an old wineskin? Now, three out of the four accounts in the Bible record our Lord's talking about the old wineskin. So this must be a very important topic. Let's look at that. In It's in Matthew 9, 17, Mark 2, 22, and Luke 5, 37. It says this, No man puts a cloth to an old garment of that which he has for that which is put in to fill it up takes from the garment and a rent is made worse no one pours new wine into old wine skin otherwise the wine will burst the skins and both the wine and the wine skin will be ruined no they pour new wine into new wine skins so both Matthew, or Matthew, Mark, and Luke all talk about this. John was the only gospel that did, did not contain the revelation of a new wineskin. You see, fabric that is new will shrink when it is laundered. Old fabric has al already withstood this process and is now set in a permanent shape. This is just like a new wineskin that is supple and it will give and, and bend, whereas the old one is fixed in its shape and it's brittle. It is human nature to slip into inflexibility, thinking we know what to do instead of having to lean upon and rest upon the Lord. In reality, we have to be like King David, who sought the Lord before he went out to battle, always asking, what, should, what would you have me do this time? The old wineskin can be seen in prayer through formula prayers, as I've said, where one plus one equals two. We say this and we always expect to receive that result. It can also be seen in traditions, the way our church or our parents have always done it. Seeing how important it is to, uh, our Lord spoke about the being flexible with a new wineskin. We know that inflexibility is not what our Lord wants from us. We can verify that this is, this is the right application of the new and the old wineskin by looking at the context, the full context of where this is said. What else was said at the right time? This scripture is mixed in with a lot of other parables, but there is one consistent element in all three accounts. The same story precedes the teaching on the new wineskin. It is the topic of fasting. So let's look at that from Luke uh, 5, 35, 33 through 35. And they said to him, being Jesus, why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers and likewise the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink? And he, being Jesus, said to them, Can you make the children of the bridal chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? 
But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then they shall fast in those days. Jesus explains why his disciples do not fast. And then he talks about the wineskin. So these two things are linked. So in order to understand the link between the two, we have to understand why we fast and pray. In the Old Testament, we see that God's people fasted as they sought revelation. Then the children of Israel and all the people went up and came to the house of God and they wept. And there they sat before the Lord and they fasted that day until the evening. And they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. This is Judges 2.26 in the American King James Version. When we fast, it's we, we set aside the basic physical demands of our body so that we can focus only on God. The disciples did this as well, and for the same purpose. It was to receive wisdom, to receive revelation. And let's look at that in Acts 13, verse 2. While they were serving the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. They were fasting and they received revelation as they set aside time to focus on God. Also in Acts 14, 23, it says, and when they had ordained them elders in every church and they prayed with, with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So they received who should be elders during a time of fasting, and then they dedicated them unto the Lord. In each of these incidents, they were seeking the Lord for guidance or direction. The main topic is uh, receiving a revelation from God. This is why we fast. You see, the Pharisees, they were fasting because it was custom, and it was based on tradition, not because God asked them to fast at that time. The spiritual leaders of the day had lost all sensitivity to God's leading. They were following tradition blindly. If they had been listening to God, they would have recognized that his son was there among them and been rejoicing and celebrating and not fasting as Jesus' disciples were. With these two metaphors about fasting and the wineskin, the Lord is in essence saying, Fasting is good, but you should be listening to God about when it should be done, or you won't be able to continue to receive and benefit from a new revelation. Unfortunately, Christians use the term new wineskin to speak of a new revelation from God, and that is only half of what's being said. As stated, when you receive a new wineskin, it is so that it'll be flexible enough to operate with the new wine. An old wineskin means that we are inflexible when applying these new revelations and it will become be torn from us. It will be no longer effective. It will become formula, tradition, or as we know, an old wineskin. God gave both of these revelations together. He gave them as one. He gave first, here's about fasting when he was asked about why do your disciples not fast? And then he talked about new and old wineskin. We have to be flexible in, even with traditions and what we know um, are God's ways and know when to apply them. We always have to ask God, what is right for this moment? It's all about flexibility. Fasting is good, but did God call you to fast? That is the new wineskin of knowing that God will let us know when things are right. When we understand that it is human nature to want to be in control, to have a path laid out for us, then we understand the dangers and how something can come, become an old wineskin. It is God's will, God's way for us to remain flexible like a new wineskin. 
lest a revelation be torn from us like new fabric on an old cloth or new wine bursting from a new wine skin. Every great revelation from the past turned brittle and inflexible as we developed formula prayers or formulas around that new revelation. Maybe for, I should say formulas and traditions around the new revelation. The dictionary definition of formula is a customary or a set, a formula, huh, let's do that again, a customary or a set form or method allowing little room for originality to accomplish a desired result. When we pray, repeating the same words to get the desired results, when we sing, it, being focused on the results instead of the, our love for God, this doesn't leave room for the Holy Spirit to guide us, to move us in what he would have us do. We must not be more focused on getting the results we want rather than listening to what God wants us to do. In the large movements of the past, where prayers were developed based on that revelation brought to the body of Christ, it wasn't long until it began losing effectiveness. The formula prayers began taking priority over listening to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not saying that you can't use a prayer written by someone else I mean, the Lord himself taught us how to pray in the Our Father prayer, but he said to pray like this, not in, you don't have to have the exact words. You can use a prayer if the Holy Spirit says to use that prayer at that time. You see, Paul, who wrote more than half of the New Testament, gave us an example of applying these principles to our life. In Philippians four or three verses four through six, it says this, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, it, if any other man thinks that he whereof might, might trust in the flesh, I more so, circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. You see, this was Paul stating who he thought he was before he became a disciple of Jesus. He had every reason to boast in fleshly matters because he was circumcised as he had to. He was from a specific tribe. tribe. He knew the law. He had studied it as a Pharisee. But what did this really mean? If we continue reading in Philippians 3 verses 7 and 8, it continues showing us what Paul is talking about. He says, but what thing, what things were gained to me, those I count as loss for Christ. Yes, doubtless, I count all the things but loss for the excellency of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, I do count them but dung that I may win Christ. He's saying all those other things are like poop. They're, they're worth nothing. I mean, there's a very impolite word I could use instead of that, but we will not use that language because we do not curse because we are Christians. So yes, Paul was saying they're all, they're all waste. They're all trash. They're all nothing. Everything that would be accredited me. This, so if, if you are applying this to yourself and you are preaching the gospel, then if you have a doctorate in theology, that's nothing. That's nothing is what he's saying here. He, Paul was a Pharisee. No, it doesn't matter how learned you are. You count it as nothing. It means nothing. We have to rely on Jesus. We must cling to his excellence, the knowledge that he brings us. This is why formulas are so dangerous. We begin depending upon what we know instead of being led by our Lord and the Holy Spirit. Hearing from our teacher and our guide, those are the names ascribed to the Holy Spirit. Hearing from him 
isn't for a privileged few. It's for every Christian. It does you no good to have a teacher if you cannot hear from him. God created you for a purpose. You have a destiny with him that is good. You are no accident. You're not too messed up for God to use you. That is a lie from the enemy. Are your mistakes bigger than God? Remember, he used a murderer who was a fugitive from the law. That's Moses. And he used the man who was pursuing God's children in order to kill them. That was Paul. He can use you if you are willing. But you must receive the new wineskin. How do you walk in that new wineskin so that you can do God's good work, so that he can do his work through you? Remember, we receive that new wineskin, which is the new revelation. Or sorry, we receive the new wine, which is the new revelation. But we must have that new wineskin ready for it. This means being flexible. Are you willing to examine your beliefs? Even if your beliefs are based on actual scripture, do they line up with the entire Bible? Or are they pulled out of context? Is there something else that you need to consider? If the Holy Spirit shows you something that doesn't line up with the Bible or contradicts who God is or what he's done in the past, well, what are you willing to do? If it contradicts the pastor, prophet, evangelist, or apostle, apostle what they have said, or what your church domination, de denomination has been teaching you for many years, what will you hold on to? Are you willing to let go of old teachings, old ways? Are you willing to be flexible with God as long as it is his word in context, as long as it's in agreement with who he is? Some of us need to shed the old wineskin so we can receive that new wine that will revive us. In Galatians 4, chapter uh, verses 24 through 25. This is the Amplified Classic Version. And to those who belong with Christ Jesus the Messiah, they have crucified the flesh. That means the godless human nature with its passions and appetites and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. If by the Holy Spirit we have our life in God, so let us go forward walking in line, our conduct controlled by the Spirit. You see, change can be difficult. Shedding that old wineskin can be hard because it battles with the flesh. The flesh desires to control everything, to have a set path before us. We must be willing to receive that correction from God, the direction from the Holy Spirit. We cannot put new wine into an old wineskin. Shedding the old wineskin literally means tossing away the old stuff that is not lined up with God's truth, remaining flexible enough to be corrected by God. Now, intercessors are often referred to as prayer warriors. They believe they're doing a lot of good as they pray for our church, the congregation, even cities and nations. A lot of these good-hearted people are getting burned out what they call burnout, from continued, continual spiritual warfare. And they begin to wonder if this warfare will ever end. Some claim it's because these prayer warriors are on the front lines. But that is not what our Lord tells us. Let's look at this. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are who labor and are heavily laden and overburdened. And I will cause you to rest. I will ease and relieve and refresh your souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am gentle, meek, humble, and lowly of heart. You will find rest, relief, and ease and refreshment, recreation and blessed quiet for your souls. For my yoke is wholesome. It is useful and good. It's not harsh or hard or sharp or pressing but comfortable, gracious, and pleasant. 
and my burden is light and easy to be borne. If you are working for the Lord, he will carry the burden for you and you will continue to feel refreshed. When you are working in the flesh, if you're working without the Lord, he, you will feel drained by your efforts. Often the ineffectiveness of prayers has us continually searching for a new prayer as we think, if only I can get the right word or have enough faith, it will work. This is not what God tells us. When we listen to the guidance of the Holy Spirit, that is when we'll get breakthrough. Using a prayer written in books often becomes witchcraft prayers. Let's see how that is slightly different from formula prayers, but slightly the same. Let's look at the crossover here. The definition of a formula, of course, is a, a set form of words used for a ceremony or a ritual, as we've stated. The definition of a spell, a spoken word or form of words held to have magic power. Both are using words to achieve a result with some sort of ritual. Using the scripture to try and force God to act is manipulation and it is a witchcraft prayer. When we utter words given us to us by man without the urging of the Holy Spirit and we expect a certain result, this is akin to witchcraft trying to manipulate the situation. So another name for a formula prayer, maybe a witchcraft prayer that kind of overlapped greatly. Are we relying on our knowledge and what we know or what we have learned or someone else has learned to bring the breakthrough instead of being guided by the Holy Spirit? That is the key to identifying the formula prayer. Learning from prayers of others is great. Sometimes the words of others can help us voice what we need to say, but there is no magic phrase, no, no silver bullet, that, no prayer that will give us everything we want. That is saying that we don't need the Holy Spirit to guide us. In some cases, prayers can even open a door to an attack upon us. For more information, please see more uh, the other classes in the traps for intercession and prayer warriors now the holy spirit should be the one to guide us in our prayers to pray without him is pride it's saying holy spirit i don't need you i already know what to pray i prefer to know what to pray i don't need you to guide me this is wrong we must be willing to receive from our counselor, our teacher, the Holy Spirit. And we must be willing to ask ourselves, is there a reason for what is occurring? We see this in Revelation 3, verse 19. And this is the Amplified Classic Version. Those whom I dearly and tenderly love, I tell their faults and convict and convince and reprove and chastise. I discipline and instruct them. So be enthusiastic and earnest in burning zeal and repent, changing your mind and attitude. Look at that. Sometimes God is chastising us. He's disciplining us. And so if we're under an attack and things are going wrong and we want things to change, sometimes we must be willing to change as well. We must change our mind, our attitude and turn and go the other direction. In order to fully operate in the new wineskin, we have to let go of formula prayers. It is critical to keep in mind that the enemy may have rights to afflict us, that God may be giving those rights to the enemy to bring trouble into our life as chastisement. When we take time to receive this information from the Lord and we apply his blood after confessing and repenting, then those attacks, those hindrances can be removed. In 1 Corinthians 1, 29, it says this. It says, no flesh should glory in his presence. 
2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 and 5, the American King James. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity the very thought, every very thought to the obedience of Christ. You see, we cannot fall into old habits and continue praying prayers that have never worked or had some limited effect and stop working. That is the flesh. That is warring after the flesh. We must war after the spirit, following the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Now, Christians are often called to pray for others or to come into agreement with others, with, with others who other prayers people have prayed. When doing this, you should keep some things in mind concerning how you're praying. When someone asks you to agree in prayer because of a situation they're struggling with, if you are struggling with the same sin, you must first repent and confess for your own sin before praying for them. Secondly, do not agree in prayer with anyone unless the Holy Spirit releases you to do so. Saying amen makes you responsible for every word that is said. You're saying, I'm in full agreement. And so if they, whatever they're praying is wrong, you are going to be part of that wrongness. Third, don't just pray with somebody because you don't want to disappoint them. We have been misled to believe that we must agree with them as an act of kindness. But sometimes that brings correction upon us as well known as backlash. Remember, prayer must come through your spirit, which is connected to the Holy Spirit. He must be the one motivating these prayers to be effective with no backlash, without any um, old wineskin in it. Shedding that old wineskin is not easy. but With the help of the Holy Spirit, it can be done. He is the one who empowers us to walk the way that we need to. So let's pray. Let's pray for each and every person here today. That God will have, let's, let's just pray. I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to pray before we pray, but you say amen if you agree with me. How's that? You can say amen in the comments. You can say amen in the room where you are. So Heavenly Father, I just come before you today and I am so grateful for the words which you have brought. I thank you for teaching us, Jesus, about the new and the old wineskin, that we are to remain flexible, dependent upon you with every new revelation. So Lord, I pray for each person who has listened to this message today and will listen in the future. Lord, I ask that you bring them wisdom. You reveal to them any place that they're, they are brittle in their life, that they're inflexible, that they're operating in that old wineskin. Holy Spirit, you are the teacher and the guide. You know. You know all things. So help them, Holy Spirit. Help them to understand and hear your voice more clearly. Show them the next step to freedom. They are not hearing your voice. They're not understanding it. Show them the next place to go to receive that freedom. Highlight, Holy Spirit, the path forward for them. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for teaching them to hear your voice so they may understand the new and the old wineskin and how to be free from any bit, any harness, to be guided by you. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, amen. If you are still learning about God's ways, and how to hear from him. That can be found in the 
narrow path, more ways to hear from God. Relief from attacks may open up, may remove things that are keeping you from hearing from the Holy Spirit. I encourage you to learn God's ways, to apply them to your life, to contact us if you're in need of help through the Let's Chat. Sometimes intercession is necessary and we are here for you. That is our, my message for you here today. Lord, I just ask that you bless them, that you keep them. Let your face shine upon them and grant them shalom until we see them again. Amen.